Hello YouTube, and uh, this is Nico from Dare to Game or DTG Productions. This is probably more like a productions video. Uh, we're doing something very different for me today. I've never, never once done this, but we're going to be... I guess this is kind of like a news sort of thing. So what you may or may not know about me is I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. Huge Tolkien fan, I should say, in general. So I've had some interest in one way or the other for this uh, Amazon show that I'm sure we've all heard about uh, over the last couple of years now. Interest... It may be a bit generous of a term. I'm very skeptical and worried about it uh, for a few reasons. So basically what we're going to be doing today is I saw this uh, story come up. Uh, basically they were saying, well, here you go, Lord of the Rings series at Amazon reveals official synopsis. Now, I, I mean, we can just quick do a, a Google search for the definition of the word synopsis because I've got a problem with, uh, you know, I'm just going to make sure. Okay, synopsis, <laughs> that's a company. Ooh, let's not use that. So... A condensed statement or outline as of a narrative or treatise, the abbreviated conjunction of a verb in one person only. Hmm. So I'm thinking we're going to go with that first one here. Uh, generally speaking, I expect there to be some, you know, statement or outline regarding the narrative, you know. So I guess this might qualify as a synopsis because they give us a few words that kind of say something about it. But honestly, it's uh, pretty slim in my opinion. We already knew that this series was going to take place in the Second Age. So we kind of, I mean, anyone who knows anything about the works of Tolkien kind of knows the big events of that. So we kind of know what goes on in the Second Age. I was expecting a little bit more detail. So, so we'll get into that in a second. Uh, but basically, what I was going to say at the beginning there is I'm pretty nervous about this show. Uh, the works of Tolkien are very specific. There's a lot of established lore. There are a lot of rules. And I don't think in this day and age, any big production company is going to make a TV that's going to follow those rules. They're going to want to jam it full of whatever they want, whether it's for diversity or uh, political correctness or whatever they're going to want to do. They're going to want to jam it in there. And those things don't belong in the world of Tolkien. You know, It's not an offensive world by any means. There's nothing in Tolkien that is... Uh, inherently offensive to anyone so there's no reason to change anything in there but i think for the sake of change because they want to make a character whatever you know they want to make them different for some reason so they can have that meet that forced diversity quota uh i think those changes will be made and that's why i'm worried about the show because lord of the rings does not need that uh the whole story is about inclusiveness and uh there's nothing negative promoted in these stories, so I don't see the reason to change them, but I believe it will be changed. So, with that in mind, that's my worry about this, uh, or at least where it started. After reading the synopsis, I've got a few more worries. So, let's just start off with it. So, uh, right here at the beginning, it just, you know, kind of talks about it, uh, shows official synopsis. Uh, so, we'll jump right into it. The epic series is described as follows. So, this is what they released. This, this is their official synopsis. Got to get my quotes up higher. So it says, Amazon Studios' forthcoming series brings to screens for the very first time the heroic legends of the fabled Second Age of Middle-Earth's history. This epic drama is set thousands of years before the events of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, and will take viewers back to an era in which great powers were forged. I'm guessing here we're going to be talking about the Rings of Power because they were forged in the Second Age. Makes sense. I don't think there's a reason to be vague about that, but that's probably what they're talking about. Kingdoms rose to glory and fell to ruin. Well, in the Second Age, mm, yeah, that would just be Elvish kingdoms. I mean, there were some Dwarvish kingdoms that came and went in the Second Age, but most of your Dwarvish kingdom collapses happened in the Third Age, and so did the great kingdoms of men like Gondor and Arnor. I mean, Gondor didn't really collapse, but it really declined, and Arnor fell in the Third Age. So they must be talking about elvish ones and to be fair there are a lot of elvish kingdoms or uh, they're more like city states the way they're described in the silmarillion they're a lot more like city states it'll be one big city and some land around it controlled by an elvish king so i don't know kingdom is generous but anyway like gondolin or places like that so that could be very exciting to see unlikely heroes were tested hope hung on the finest of threads that's certainly true and the greatest villain that ever flowed from Tolkien's pen threatened to cover all the world in darkness. Well, I don't want to nag, but the primary antagonist of the Second Age was Sauron, 
and he's not the greatest villain that ever flowed from Tolkien's pen. That would be Morgoth. Uh, that may be a little bit pedantic, though, so we'll let that go. I guess Sauron's more fleshed out in the stories, so maybe, maybe that's what they mean. Anyway, beginning in a time of relative peace, the series follows an ensemble cast of characters, both familiar and new. I don't like that. And new, unless they're saying just new to the screen. Because when I hear familiar, I think, okay, maybe they're going to have some elves that we've seen uh, in the movies or books, because those elves are thousands, thousands of years old. Thranduil could be in here. He was alive at this point. Uh, Galadriel, Elrond, uh, Sirdan, all of those elves, yeah, they were alive at this point. Uh, as far as I know, the Astari, the wizards, Gandalf, Saruman, they don't come until the beginning of the Third Age, so they shouldn't be in the story. So anyone familiar we see, as long as they don't mean, as long as by new they don't mean they're creating new characters, because that would be garbage. There are so many characters in the Legendarium already that they definitely don't need to create new ones, but I, I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will, and we'll get to that in a bit. But so familiar, so we've discussed that. As they confront the long-feared reemergence of evil to Middle-earth. From the darkest depths of the Misty Mountains, that I'm super excited to see. I'm hoping they don't mean goblin caves. I'm hoping they mean like a dwarven kingdom like Moria. I want to see that in live action, in good condition. That's something I've always wanted. So hopefully that's something that is good to be excited about, and it won't just, you know, dash my hopes. To the majestic forests of the elf capital of Linden. Could be exciting. Less excited about that because the movies, both the Lord of the Rings movies and the Hobbit movies, already did a very good job of depicting Lothlorien and Rivendell. And sure, those aren't as big as Gondolin or something like that, so it'll be still cool to see those as long as they do a good job. But less excited for that. Probably the most exciting thing, the breathtaking island of Numenor. Uh, I've read The Silmarillion several times, actually just finished reading through it again uh, maybe a week ago. And just consistently speaking in that and all the other works in the Legendarium, Numenor is the most interesting. It's insanely interesting. And I think that mostly comes from the fact that it's the most well-developed part of all of the Legendarium other than the War of the Ring. J.R.R. Tolkien spent a lot of time on Numenor. So it's got a lot of lore, a lot of background, and it's just very cool. Uh, so, very excited for that. And that says, to the furthest reaches of the map. So, I'm guessing they're probably going to go east, because you definitely see a lot of, uh, you see a lot less of that in all Lord of the Rings media. So you've got uh, Ruin, um, Harad, that which would be where the Haradrim come from. Those are the people that ride the elephants in the Lord of the Rings movie. Or Oliphants, you know, the great big elephants. Uh, so that's that's all east of what we generally see. So that's probably what they're talking about. And I would guess that that's an attempt to bring a lot more diversity onto the screen. And to be fair, that area of the map is not very well described. So if they're going to be real creative with everything, I would rather have it be over there. Like, or people coming from over there. Make that your creative license because that's where there's a lot less legendarium covering it. Uh, we know that... And if they have the, I believe they have the rights to the Silmarillion, which no one else who's made a film or movie before has had. So they could actually explore, I mean, they can't if they set it in the Second Age because those Istari don't, they're not there, or at least as far as I know, they might have come over before the ones that hit the West. Anyway, there are two Istari, or two more wizards, the Blue Wizards, that went East. And you never see them in the Hobbit or Lord of the Rings stories. They never get talked about because, well, Gandalf mentions them once in passing, but because they're over there. And so we have no idea what they were up to. So that could be interesting if we ever get to that time period. But anyway, so that's what I assume they mean by the furthest reaches of the map. And it says, these kingdoms and characters will carve out legacies that will live on long after they're gone. That's true. I mean, nothing really to debate there. Uh, so that's all exciting. I would guess, spur the you know top of my head, that this is going to be a series that maybe it's probably going to jump around in time a lot. Because really, that's how the Silmarillion works. The Silmarillion is kind of structured like the Bible covers just thousands of years. It's not a narrative story like The Lord of the Rings, where all these characters are going to interact with each other. In fact, a lot of the best stories are like three or four generations, because you'll start out with someone, and then it'll go to their son or daughter, and then their son or daughter, and their son or daughter, and it'll kind of tell the story out like that. So they shouldn't really be running into each other all the time. They should have... I mean, if I was going to design it, I would say one season would cover one story. So maybe Gondolin, or the fall of Gondolin, or 
uh, Turin Turimbar or something like that. Like it would be contained stories within a season. That's probably how I would do it, but that's probably not how they're going to do it. So I'm nervous about how they're planning to direct all this. Uh, so anyway, it goes on to say the show's official Twitter account had previously sent out an image of a map. And it, uh, along with two messages, one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. I was like, I'm, I'm glad they inclu- included that line. It was never included in any of the movies or anything. They'd always say the first two thirds of the line and then skip the last one. I was, I was like, why? I mean, I get it. It doesn't ri- rhyme, but it's important. <laughs> uh, and then they also posted on there, welcome to the second age. Again, they're saying this is when... Uh, the rings of power, including Sauron's One Ring, came into existence. I mean, no need to be vague there again, came into existence. Uh, Sauron and Celebrimbor crafted them. Well, Sauron was Anatar, the Lord of Gifts, and he taught Celebrimbor how to make rings of power, and this is where they were made. Uh, so I'm guessing, I mean, we kind of knew going into it that that was definitely going to play a big part because it's the most relevant uh, piece of information from the Second Age that ties into the Lord of the Rings that we already know, the three movies that are out, and then the Hobbit movies. So I think everybody already knew that that was definitely going to be one of the stories, was going to be how the Rings of Power were crafted and all of that. And to be fair, that should be interesting. I mean, we've seen some more of that through the uh, Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War games, but those aren't canon. So as far as I know, I actually don't know if this would be canon either. In fact, as far as I know, in Tolkien's world, the only thing that's canon is what was written, by J.R.R. Tolkien. That's it. I think, like, the movies, the Hobbit films, none of that's canon as far as the Legendarium is concerned. So this show won't, following those rules, the show also will not be canon. It's basically really, really expensive fan fiction. So, interesting aside there. So then, here's the part where I start getting a little concerned, and it's because what I see behind the scenes. So anyway, the show has assembled a massive cast. It's not usually something I want to brag about. I want a cohesive cast. I want a talented cast. I don't care how big the cast is, except if it gets too big, because then it's really hard to make a good show if you can't have character development. And if you've got too many people sharing the screen, it's hard to have good character development. But anyway, so that's only the start of what I have a problem with this part. I went through all these actors, There were uh, and the 20 more actors that were announced to the series back in December. I remember looking through this list back in December and thinking, hmm... Not a lot of big names here. Not not any big names here. Not even any medium names here. I think I'd, I've heard of one or maybe two of them before. And out of, you know, I go through all their IMD page, IMDB pages, which we'll, we'll go through quickly for each of these people. Uh, and most of them, even the stuff that they're in, I've never even heard of. So, and I mean, I consume a lot of media, so it's pretty bad if I've never heard of any of the movies or shows that they've even been in. So, But we'll get into each of that. Uh, I'm just saying, based on these actors, we can make one of one or more of, of several assumptions. So the first one is, there are no big names in here, or at least none that have been announced so far. I would guess that any real big names, they'll hold close, they'll hold them tight uh, until just before the show starts to try to really spark excitement in the last moment. I'm guessing they're just trying to drum up a little bit in the interim here. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't announce these people. These people have no star power. These people have no selling ability. They, they're, they're not going to draw anyone to it. All you're doing is they're like, hey, look, here's 20 more people that we have in the show. It means nothing. It really does mean nothing. Uh, so that that's where I would start with this little part. Um, but, so the assumptions we could make about this are a couple. I would say, A, I think I remember reading somewhere that this was going to be a relatively high-budget show. I think they were going to outspend Game of Thrones, which was a high-budget show. So, hopefully that means that it's going to look good, because they're not spending much money on these actors. Because I can't imagine any one of these actors commands any sort of significant price tag, even for a TV show. Because, like I said, they just, they have no... They've got no star power. They don't They don't pull anyone in. There's not, oh my god, I can't believe the show has Robert Aramayo in it. It's going to be so good. You know, that's that's not what's happening here. Now, mind you, some of these people might be very talented. I don't know. Uh, like I said, I've never seen the movies they're in. But going through the movies, most of them are horror movies or art house movies or just really obscure stuff that I've never heard of before. And none of those scream good actor 
I'm not saying good actors have never been in those type of movies. I'm just saying the vast, vast majority of those movies don't have good actors in them. That's why they're in those movies. So that's one thing. I would, I would say hopefully the best case scenario from what we've seen of the actors being announced so far is that they're spending a lot of money on the sets and the graphics or whatever, something like that, and trying to develop actors that maybe they see something special in. That's that's my best case scenario takeaway from all the actors I've seen attached to this project so far. Uh, worst case scenario, I mean, who knows? Maybe they're trying to get relatively unknown actors so they don't bring any controversy to the movie because as we've seen last several years in Hollywood have been pretty bad controversy wise. So there's that, that could be a possibility. Another one could be, it could be COVID related. So maybe these are the only people that were willing to work on anything right now because they didn't want to, you know, be out there exposed to COVID. That could be. I know a lot of Hollywood's been in lockdown or real tight for the last year or so. So that could be a thing. Uh, it's hard to believe that no big names are interested in this project, given that in this day and age, high budget TV is a great career choice for a lot of actors. And Lord of the Rings is a well developed uh, IP that's got a lot of star power associated with it and a lot of money. So like I said, I, I have a hard time believing that they couldn't attract any big names if they wanted to. You know, I don't see a lot of big names turning down a permanent or a long-time role on a high-budget TV show like this. It's hard to believe. So I have to imagine that they specifically aren't looking for them. Uh, but that's just me. So in brief, let's uh, pop through so we can kind of go through and see these people that they're, that they're bragging about getting. So for starters, we have Robert... Aramayo. And you may recognize him, as I did, as young Ned Stark from Game of Thrones. See? Right here. You know, he says, no, now it begins. He's got like four lines in the whole show. Ah, flawlessly executed though. And then we've got something called Nocturnal Animals. I'm guessing a horror movie. Galveston. I, I don't know. I've never heard of it before. Antebellum. Guessing another horror movie. Ah, uh, of course, that's not everything that he's associated with, but those are the top things. I've seen Game of Thrones. He had a bit part in Game of Thrones. That's the best, best thing I can say about him. Next, we've got Owain Arthur. Looks vaguely familiar, but uh, The Palace, Babylon, The Patrol, and Nino Kuni 2. Okay, so I've actually seen that. It's a video game. I, I'm familiar with that project. Never, never played it. Okay, I guess there's that. Otherwise, never heard of him. Uh, Nazanin Boniati, I would, I would guess. Uh, probably the most impressive on this list. I, you know, I'm familiar. I mean, I'm not a fan of sitcoms, so I've never seen this. And I'm assuming she was just, a, a, you know, a guest star or something like that. But that's just a guess. I don't know. I've never watched How I Met Your Mother. Homeland, I'm familiar with. Good show on the whole. So impressive enough. Never heard of Counterpart. I guess it's another TV show because it's got a year range in there, so could be good. Hotel Mumbai I'm familiar with, so, you know, not familiar with her in there, but she's she's got the most recognizable. Well, apparently she was in Zoolander 2 and Ben-Hur, these, uh, all these remakes and sequels. So probably the most star power on this list, at least so far. Uh, next we've got Tom Budge, another one that looks vaguely familiar, like I've probably seen him on something, but... I couldn't say what, because I certainly have not seen Candy, The Proposition, or Judy and Punch. So, I don't know. Maybe I'm just thinking he looks like uh, that guy from Breaking Bad. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Could be. Next, we've got um, Morphid Clark, known for Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, Crawl, and St. Maud. Some horror movies and, and B-movie sci-fi thrillers. Could be really good. I just don't know. I've never heard of her before. Uh, then we've got Ishmael Cruz Cordova. Uh, again, another one that looks slightly familiar. I don't know what for, though, because I've never... Maybe I saw a preview for Mary Queen of Scots. I believe that's the Kate Blanchett one. Or she's in it or something. I can't remember. I, I remember seeing previews and thinking, wow, I'm not interested in that. Um, I've heard of The Good Wife. I've never heard of The Catch. Uh, I've never heard of In the Blood, so see if there's anything down here that maybe... Oh, he's in The Mandalorian, so that's probably where I saw him, because I watched The Mandalorian. So that's that's most likely where I saw this this actor. So, because I was going to say, I saw the picture, I was like, looks familiar. 
Okay. So next we've got uh, Emma Horvath. What Lies Below? That sounds vaguely familiar. N nope, never mind. The 2020 film. The 205th, Don't Look Deeper, and The Gallows Act. So we've got another horror movie actor. Uh, Markella Kavanaugh, uh, Romper Stomper, Picnic at Hanging Rock, The Cry, and My First Summer. Some more art house films and uh, horror movies. Joseph Maul, here we go. He was Benjamin Stark on Game of Thrones. Remember, he was in like an episode way at the beginning. <laughs> then we got Birdsong, In the Heart of the Sea, and Ripper Street. Not familiar with them. <laughs> Let's see if there's anything else. Troy, Fall of a City. I've never even heard of that show. Uh, like I said, Game of Thrones. Okay, okay, so he's in he's in six episodes of it, so maybe I was being unfair. He's just, he doesn't play a very large role in it. Uh, I mean, what he was in, he was good, or good enough. Like, he he didn't stick out as, well. Wow, that guy's really bad. Well, he was an Abraham Lincoln vampire hunter. Oh, I take it all back. <laughs> okay, apparently he was in Merlin and The Walking Dead. So yeah, like I said, so here we've got another one more well-established. Never done anything terribly impressive that I've seen, but well-established. Probably has more star power than everyone else on this list so far. So there's that. Then we've got uh, Tyro Muhafidin, um, known for Treasure Maps and Tin Spaghetti. It was a short film. And, uh, oh, this this show. That's Im impressive to add to your you're, uh, I'm not trying to say any of these people are bad. I don't know. I'm just saying, why add all of these people into your article and talk about them as if it's some big deal? We've got a kid who's never been in anything before. And then we've got Sophia Namvet, also never been in anything before. <laughs> Megan Richards, uh, who do we got? Wanderlust, Doctors, and uh, Pan Tao. Never heard of it. Dylan Smith, another kid. Apparently was in something with Robin Williams. Or at least that's what that uh, would make me think. One hour photo. Oh, he was in Pirates of the Caribbean. He played Young Will. Okay. That was a while ago. How old is this guy? Born in 92. That's That must be an outdated picture. Okay. So I've seen Pirates of the Caribbean, like many people. Apparently he was kid number two in Gilmore Girls, so that's impressive. Then we got Charlie Vickers. I had to double take on it. Kind of looked like uh, Ramsey. Uh, it was in Medici, so I've heard of that show. Never watched it, but heard it. And then lastly, we've got Daniel uh, Wyman, or Wayman. Uh, was in Gentleman Jack, A Very English Scandal, Foils, War, and Silent Witness. I'm guessing a BBC actor is what we've got here. Which, nothing, no shade. I'm not throwing shade or anything there. Just, again, never heard of this person. And don't think of, I've seen Poirot, but not a new Poirot. So, not the one I'm thinking of. Or the, the you know, ones I'm thinking of. So, there we go. I went through all of them. As you can see, some impressive star power, the caliber of which has never been seen before. People like to compare this to Game of Thrones. People are That's the comparison that's being drawn here. Uh, Game of Thrones didn't start with no star power. A lot of the main cast on Game of Thrones brought a lot of people's attention because you had established actors. I mean, we could just go through a, a few of them quick. Okay, so let's start out with a few that get, get introduced immediately. Uh, Eddard Ned Stark, Sean Bean, in tons of stuff. A lot of movies, several TV shows, very well established. Arguably the most star power in the first season of Game of Thrones. I think that's what draw, drew a lot of people's attention. He was the selling point. So, biggest name in there. But they had at least one big name attached. Now we've got Robert Baratheon, Mark Addy. Mark Addy's in quite a few things. Uh, he was in the most, or not the most recent Robin Hood movie. The most recent good one. Because that, that most recent one was really bad. Uh... Tyrion Lannister, Peter Dinklage. Uh, Peter Dinklage is a fantastic actor. Definitely gained a lot of his star power from being on Game of Thrones, but he was established before it. Uh, Lena Headey, I know she's had some previous projects. I'm not super familiar with any of them, but I know I've seen her in stuff before Game of Thrones. Again, established actor. Catelyn Stark. Off the top of my head, Michelle Fairley. She was Hermione's mom in a Harry Potter movie once. I, she's probably got a lot of other stuff. I could look at it, but I'm not going to. That's not what this video is about. But my point is... Until you get down to, like, the children, who I don't think had really been in anything before this, you had some pretty well-established cast. So this is not the same thing. So that's all I'm saying, drawing that comparison. So anyway, let's keep moving on. The Lord of the Rings series is written and executive produced by J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay. In addition, J.A. Bayona is set to direct multiple episodes. So there we've got some 
information. Let's see what it means. So John D. Payne, known for, he was a writer on Deadliest Warrior, a reality TV show where they have computer simulations of people from the past fighting each other. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy the show. Wildly inaccurate in my opinion, but not exactly something that the writing has to be very good on. Boilerplate, Flash Gordon, earlier screenplay. It was just announced, so he's known for something that there's no information about yet. Apparently he was a uncredited writer on Star Trek Beyond. Not something I'm a fan of, so okay, we've got that. Patrick McKay, similar. <laughs> Seems to share all of the same stuff. Interesting. Maybe they always write as a pair. Who can say? Then we've got J.A. Bayona, who, I mean, oh, The Impossible. See, I was thinking Mission Impossible. I was like, hey, I've actually heard of that one. Not a fan, but I've heard of it. Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Okay. That's a pretty big movie. He directed it. Apparently wasn't just a writer or something on it. He directed it. I didn't see it. Not a Jurassic World fan. Don't really care for dinosaurs too much. Uh, okay, though. I could see why that's worth putting in your article. It's a relatively big name, I guess. That movie made a bunch of money. Showrunner-wise, though, uh, or, or writer. So those are just the writers. They're not necessarily the showrunners. But no experience, or at least none that anybody knows or cares about. So that's disconcerting. To be fair, it's, it's a very well-developed world that they're building in. It's not like Game of Thrones where they run out of source material eventually. This source material is all there. So maybe it'll be really good. Who knows? In addition to those previously announced, the show's full creative team will consist of executive producers Lindsay Weber, Bruce Richmond, Callum Green, Amazon's former head of genre programming, Sharon Tal Yaguado, I guess, Jennifer Hutchinson, Jason Cahill, Justin Doble, co-producer and VFX producer Ron Ames, and writer and co-producer Helen Shang, and producer Chris Newman. Bayona will also executive produce, along with his partner, Belin Etienza. That's, uh, that's the whole article in a nutshell there. I mean, not much to dig into there. I mean, other than what we did, look at these names that they're bragging about. Uh, so, takeaways. We know very little more than we knew before. I mean, they kind of list a couple of places, so it's exciting. I'm excited about Numenor, excited to see hopefully a Dwarven Kingdom. Uh, those are both exciting. There's a few actors that I've heard of vaguely that are connected to the pro uh, to the project now, in addition to those back in December. Like I said, I don't want to go over them because that's old news. Not a whole lot of star power getting drawn in, uh, and no experience in the writing, or none to very little experience in the writing and directing side of things. So that's uh, that's our article in a nutshell. That's the big news that came out about Lord of the Rings series at Amazon. I just wanted to talk about this. This is totally new for me. I don't normally do this type of content uh, on this channel, and but it's something I care very deeply about uh, and am concerned about based on what I've seen so far. So that's, uh, that's all we've got for today. Uh, a little bonus video, I guess. So hope you liked it, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching another Dare to Game video. If you like this video, please leave a like and a comment. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the channel. If you like my content and would like to support this channel, consider becoming a member today for as little as $1.99 a month. It makes a huge difference. But in any case, thanks for watching and have a nice day. I'll see you next time.